So welcome back. Um, right now we're going to talk a little bit about using the resources and materials and organizing them well inside of your space. Every time I work with teachers on the ground, one of the first questions they'll ask me is, how do I create the maker space for writers? And while my first inclination is always to talk about the fact that making, you know, it really is um, a mindset, it's a culture as well, and that in order to inspire making, it really isn't about the materials first, it's about the choices that you're allowing kids to have. It's about giving them permission to experiment um, with new forms. And it's about encouraging them to test new ideas and strategies and things that you haven't taught them in order to tinker around with their writing and the stuff that they're building so that they can create new things. And oftentimes that requires a little bit of struggle and a little bit of failure and a whole lot of messiness. Um, and that that's really the most impart, important part of creating a makerspace. However, I know that if you are an English teacher, an English language arts teacher, if you're teaching writing inside of a workshop or a studio, it becomes, you know, it's an important question to ask. How do I get materials in their hands and what materials should they be? And how do I organize all of this so that it's not taking over my entire room, especially if you're working in a small space? So what you see on the table today are all of the different containers I've used to um, create tinker trays, tinker totes, and tool buckets um, for kids in different settings and for different purposes. One thing that I wanna let you know um, that, that's really important to know is that you don't need to spend a lot of money. You're gonna notice when you look over here that I have these you know, plastic trays. A, a box top is just as, as you know, helpful to use and, and just as um, effective. These literally were donated to me um, from a friend who was cleaning out her office and I kind of held on to them. And they make for really good tinker trays, which I'm gonna build with you in, in um, a subsequent video. These I've had since my very first year of teaching. They're 23 years old. They came from the dollar store way back when. You probably have similar things lying around your house. These also make for really good um, containers to house different maker materials in. These are really pretty and they're nice. I picked them up on sale from a Big Lots and that's the only reason why I got them because I think they were 75% off. They're wooden um, and they make for a really nice aesthetic. They also stack nicely. But so do the trays, um, honestly, and you can stack them on top of each other. Totes like this, which people are very familiar with, also make for great tinker um, trays as well. When I am working long term with writers and in my own writing studio, I really like the idea of using this tool bucket. So the tool bucket I got from um, my Home Depot and this liner I think was like five or 10 extra dollars. The tool buckets can last for years though and the thing I like about them is you can fill them with lots of larger materials and to design one per group can be a very helpful thing. I've also though used tiny sorts of totes, things like this that open and have dividers in them that you can put small loose parts in and you're gonna notice that with the smaller ones, you're a little bit more constrained in the materials that you're giving kids. And that's an important thing to think about, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Little buckets like this that are much smaller, you know, in scale compared are helpful. And these little totes, which came from a dollar store, um, and I think that they were two or three for a dollar, these can be really neat ways, you know, really neat containers um, for your tinker totes. I've used little bags like this before as well and one of my favorites this year especially when i'm working with large large groups and i don't have um, a ton of space in my suitcase and i also don't have a ton of money to spend so if i'm working with like 200 teachers at a time i love using these tiny tinker totes and all they are are coin envelopes um, and look around because they vary wildly, wildly in price and they can be expensive but um, i actually found mine at walmart and um, they were relatively inexpensive. These tiny little envelopes can house a limited number of really interesting loose parts. So a loose part is something that we can hold in our hands and it's something that we can mix and remix in order to build things. When I open up my little tiny tinker tote here, these are ones that are left over from a, a recent trip to Alberta, Canada. And if you were there, hello and I had so much fun with you. Um, what we find inside are actually two little black buttons 
and a bee, a little bee button. Imagine the story that you or your students or, or your colleagues might make. How might you make a story with two buttons and a bee? This leads me to my next conversation, which we're gonna spend some time in subsequent videos and in slides and sessions talking about. The materials that we offer writers are important and there's no one right way to combine materials, but it is important to think with intention about what materials might do inside of these different tool buckets and totes um, and tinker trays. It used to be that I would just take any random loose parts and throw them inside of um, these containers. And I still do that once in a while. But what I've come to realize is that some materials are more dynamic than others and others are more static. It's not that one is better or worse, but it does affect the way that kids build with them and how they think. When I was working with teachers two weeks ago, it was very interesting because we built with both Play-Doh and clay. And I asked the teachers to tell me which did they prefer. And most of the teachers told me that they preferred to build with clay because it did what, it, it, what they wanted it to do. It was very pliable and they could make it work the way that they wanted it to. Legos were less sort of bendy, less forgiving, less yielding. But they also said that when they worked with Lego, they had to be more thoughtful about what it is they were building. And I thought that that was very interesting. Um, and so when I have teachers work with Lego or kids, it's with a purpose. And when I have them work with Play-Doh or clay, it's with a purpose as well. If I give them two buttons and a B, I'm also thinking about what can they do with that and what are the constraints inside of those materials. So in the next subsequent set of slides and videos, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about putting materials together with intention, being reflective and thoughtful about how much, um, how many, um, what kind of materials, when they're offered, and how they kind of work with each other and dialogue together. Um, before we do that, I'm gonna let my dog in, who you can probably see jumping around back there. I'll be back and we're going to talk a little bit about what to fill these different containers with.